Um, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a very warm welcome to the Technical Museum Nikola Tesla on behalf of the museum and on my own. I'm really glad that we can uh, establish the uh, collaboration with the Norwegian Embassy and also that we all will be able present here and uh, our online followers to participate or to attend the lecture by Mr. Paul Brecke uh, on the topic that is very interesting and intriguing in the scientific sense, but also in kind of human or emotional even sense, because there are many of us, including me, that uh, have a dream to see Aurora Borealis in life. So, a uh, very warm welcome to all of you, and especially to our hosts, which, are, which is the Norwegian Embassy, and to the lecturer. Welcome. Yes, Mr. Ambassador. So, uh, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would also like to wish you a heartily welcome to this lecture. Um, and thank you to the uh, Technical uh, Museum uh, Nikola Tesla for uh, hosting us here. Uh, I should say that uh, we, we consider different places uh, to have this lecture. Uh, it could be a cinema, it could be somewhere. But uh, as uh, Mr. Brecke will take us from the mythical part up to the scientific part, uh, we found that this is uh, the, uh, the perfect environment, uh, the ambient uh, for, for a lecture uh, on a topic like this. So uh, that's why we are here. We hope to cooperate with the uh, Technical Museum Nikola Tesla more in the future. Um, the topic which I got presented here is uh, something which, uh, in, as it said, intrigues people uh, world or, or wherever in the world. Um, uh, some in Croatia have uh, done more of it. So uh, when uh, uh, the lecture is over and we have some Q&As, uh, we will, uh, Mr. Hrvoj Juric will uh, uh, link up his photos uh, from the uh, uh, from the high north. Uh, he's also traveling uh, everywhere. I last saw him on the social media and he was on Bellybit or something. So he's, he's everywhere. But uh, there is a, a Croatia connection also, so which we'll link up after we have heard the lecture from Mr. Paul Brecke. So uh, I give the floor to you, Mr. Thank you so much, and thank you for the kind introduction and for inviting me. Uh, I actually here in this city for a big conference on, on space weather. Uh, basically, the sun is also causing us some problems sometimes, so that's why I'm here. So now I'm going to take you on to a journey from uh, ancient myths and to modern science and explain a little bit about this, uh, the history and uh, go also through the first person that actually explained the Northern Lights, a Norwegian scientist. And... Um, also try to argue for you that Norway is the best place to go to see it in Norlites. Um, and uh, it's the most amazing light phenomena that nature can actually uh, create. And like you said, it is, uh, it's a thing that most people want to, to see in their lifetime. And uh, of course, then you should come to Norway. I'm going to explain why a little bit later. Uh, all the pictures and all the animations you will see in this movie is basically taken from my own documentary uh, that came out a few years back and also from my uh, book. So I have a few copies back there so you can take a look at it. But in principle, you can download this from my website. I'll come back to that slide later. So we're gonna go far back in time now. And, and before uh, people understood what the Northern Light was, they, most people was afraid of it. Very often it was taken as a message from the creator and that God was angry or a war will break out. Uh, in North Norway, the indigenous people, the Sami people, they still called the, the, the Northern Light Gohovsas, the light you can hear. And lots of people think they can hear some crackling sounds, uh, almost like we hear it in the auditorium here, um, like a folding aluminum when there's a strong Northern Lights. The problem is, when I come back to that later, is that the altitude where the Northern Light is created is a vacuum, so there's no air, and sound can, in principle, not travel through air, so we don't really understand it yet. And also lots of the indigenous people had this uh, belief that the Northern Light was actually dead spirits trying to contact us 
And, and, and you had these stories about the Eskimos in Greenland, they're playing soccer with the walrus skull on the on night sky. So there's all these interesting stories. And even the Mandan Indian in North Dakota, they have stories about the Northern Light when they saw this glow in, in the North Horizon. And they thought it was the reflection of the fires uh, of big pots where the Indians of far north are boiling their enemies in the big pots. So it's kind of crazy stories. In Finland, they call the Northern Lights Revontule, which is the name of the Arctic fox running far north. And the fur was touching the mountains and snow was going up in the sky and gave reflections as the Northern Lights. So again, lots of good, nice stories. And in Denmark, there was this uh, kind of romantic story that uh, it was a throng, uh, flock of swans flying far north and went to sleep in a pond. And the next morning, they were frozen in and they couldn't get loose and they flapped their wings to try to escape the pond or the ice. And again, that gave this reflection on the sky. And we shouldn't go that far back in Norway where there's still uh, people thought their kids, but we went outside, you can uh, wave with white hand handkerchiefs and intensify the, the northern lights. Uh, and I know people that still have been hearing that story from their grandparents. So again, lots of good stories about the, the northern lights. Um, the Vikings saw, of course, the northern lights. Uh, and they f sailing out in a dark sea, and they were the first to actually use the expression Northern Lights, or Nordurius, that they called it at that time. Um, but you also probably know that uh, it has a scientific name, the Latin name they used, uh, the Aurora Borealis. And a little bit surprisingly, uh, the person that actually used that first was a very famous guy living in Italy. And that was Galileo, famous for using a telescope and watching the sky. But he saw this red hue in the horizon, and that's why he called it the, the Aurora Borealis, which is the red dawn of the north. So in many ways, he gave it the wrong name, uh, because he never saw the green light. So the only time the northern light comes that far south as in Italy, you can only see the red part of the northern lights. And that red hue has uh, scared people up through history. Uh, Emperor Tiberius, he saw the same kind of thing, and he thought his town of Austria was put on fire by the enemy, so he sent troops down to save his harbor city, but there was no war down there. It was only some red northern lights he saw on the horizon. Uh, maybe the first scientific thoughts you can find written down is actually found in the uh, uh, chronicle called, I hope it was starting here, um, uh, King's Mirror, written in year 1060. It was a textbook written for the sons of King Magnus Lagerböte, and in this book, they actually have three explanations of the Northern Light, which they tried to explain it naturally. At that time, the Earth was supposed to be flat, or they thought the Earth was flat. And one theory in the book was that there's fires around the flat Earth giving reflection on the sky as the Northern Lights. Another very interesting theory in this book was also that the sun has gone down below the horizon uh, of this flat Earth, and then sun rises then uh, reflecting on ice crystals up in the sky. This was another explanation. And then the third explanation was fires uh, over Greenland. They, they reflected on the ice, and you can see it from, from Norway. None of them were correct, of course, but it's still nice that they already then thought about natural explanations. And actually, in, in 1709, uh, the Swedish uh, astronomer, uh, he publishes thesis and actually used the same theory, that the sun has gone down, and you're standing up here, uh, where D is, and you're looking up and you see reflected lights on ice crystals in the sky. This is basically the same thing that you can see as uh, night glowing clouds today. Um, but later when we got spectroscopy, we can split the light up into different colors. We can determine that they couldn't be reflected sunlight, have to be something else. And this is uh, Edmund Halley. He was famous for you know, discovering uh, Halley's Comet, but he was also very interested in the northern lights. And he had this theory that it was magnetic liquid that was streaming out to the Arctic region up along the magnetic field lines of the Earth and created the Northern Lights. That was, of course, not either correct. But he had another interesting observation that he saw when the, the top arc of the Northern Light did not point towards the uh, geographic North Pole, but to the magnetic pole, which is different from the geographic pole. So that was important. So they knew there was some connection with the Earth's magnetic field, and when there was strong magnetic field, the compass needle was moving back and forth. And Christopher Hanstein, another Norwegian scientist, he managed to get the measurements of these variations of compass needles from all the sailors that was sailing up in the Arctic. 
And from all this measurement, he could determine when they, where these variations occurred over a long period of time. And then he understood that the Northern Light was actually formed in a circle around the magnetic pole. And he made the first drawing of the Aurora Oval, which we know today. Very uh, interesting and famous uh, drawing. Uh, then it was a, a French scientist called Jean-Jacques Maran. He was the first to actually propose there was a connection with the sun, that there, maybe there was a connection between the Earth's atmosphere and the sun's atmosphere. But he didn't have any physical explanation for this. So that kind of theory died away a little bit. And then in 1859, there was a very, very strong explosion on the sun that the scientist in the UK saw, Carrington. He saw that flash through his telescope. And then 17 hours later, there was a very strong northern light that moved all the way down to the equator. So the whole Earth was basically covered with auroras. He didn't either have any explanation how that could uh, be connected. Uh, but again, that was also the, a, a sign that was the sun that was actually causing the northern light. And then they continued to do research on the uh, northern lights. And since they didn't have any cameras to take pictures, very often scientific expedition in the Arctic brought with them artists to make drawings of the northern lights. And there's some example of beautiful artwork that was made by uh, painters that went up the Arctic. So we had to wait until the end of the 18th century, 1895. Uh, Christian Birkland came up with this uh, beautiful theory that it was a particle, of, charged particle from the sun that moved through space and was captured by the Earth's magnetic field and channeled down towards the polar region and uh, creating the Northern Lights. And nobody really believed him. But he was also famous for other things. He was an excellent uh, inventor. He had patents on 60 different things. Uh, electric, he made the first electric hearing aid, uh, refining of oil, uh, and uh, uh, lots of other things, caviar. He was took a patent on caviar even. And, and, but the most famous experiment was to this, make this electric, electromagnetic cannon that exploded when he demonstrated this for the, the audience. But then he, sm he saw an arc, strong arc, just like we saw in the Tesla laboratory, and he smelled nitrogen. And he, together with some AIDA, he, uh, Christian Birklund, then found a way to uh, harvest nitrogen from the air and making artificial fertilizer. But at that time, it was a big problem with the lack of fertilizer, and uh, the world will start starving if it didn't find this solution. And he established then the company Norsk Hydro, which today is called Yara, and still now the biggest fertilized company in the world, thanks to Birkland's fail experiment in the, the University of Oslo at that time. Anyway, <coughs> like I said, nobody believed this theory. Uh, the big scientists in the world said, space is empty, there's no particles there. So he made this uh, first, to the left, to actually a little... Uh, Aurora jar, but then this famous experiment is a glass box. Uh, he pumped up all the air, he put a uh, magnet inside this uh, metal sphere, which represented the Earth, and then he bombarded this with electron, actually three years before the electron was actually discovered. And he managed to create artificial uh, northern lights around this globe. And he saw also there was similar things on the southern hemisphere. So then he has argued that he proved his own theory, but still nobody believed him. Uh, the big scientists in the UK, the Chapman and Lord Kelvin, didn't believe it and actually uh, made fun of Birklund. Um, and we actually had to wait for 60 years after he died in 1921 before we could prove his theory when we got satellites that measure the solar wind and measure the magnetic disturbances in the atmosphere. So it took a long time before he was uh, proved. So in Norway, he got the, the, the kind of some honor when the, we put this face on this tuna crown build in 1994. Uh, there's lots of information about uh, physics on this bill, a uh, very famous bill. Um, unfortunately, Norwegian Bank, the Norwegian bank, actually canceled this bill exactly when we had the 200 year anniversary of a big clone and changed it with this uh, codfish. <laughs> um, but there's still a little northern lights there. It's a little uh, hologram here. You can see there's a moving uh, holographic uh, aurora oval. So there's a little bit still left. And then uh, for those who are from Norway and have a new passport the last two, three years, there's actually northern lights as a theme also on the passport. So when you look at the passport in daytime, it looks like this. It's the Lofoten uh, Mountains and the ocean and the sun. And as soon as you put the passport under ultraviolet light to check if it's uh, real, uh, it will look like this. The northern light will shine up and say it's a real passport. So this passport actually won the design, uh, international design prize for this kind of cool thing. 
Uh, Norwegian airline has his face on this, the tail. Uh, Google made this little doodle during this anniversary. And there's also a big electric ship now being built. This is uh, with his name on it. It's built by Yara and the uh, Kongsberg Group. So we recognize him. And one more scientist I want to mention is uh, Carl Sturmer. He was the first to actually make a, a camera that can take pictures of the Northern Lights. Uh, and he put two cameras on different locations. He sent the students, of course, far, far out in the, in the forest, and he was sitting close to his uh, office building. But then he can triangulate and find the actual height of the northern lights, which was not known at that time. So it's basically from 100 kilometers up to 700 kilometers. This is a space phenomenon. So to understand the northern lights, we need to understand the sun, which is the engine that's driving the northern lights all the time. And for most people, we are thinking of the sun as a yellow sphere coming up in the morning, goes down in the evening, and it looks kind of boring. It's uh, not much you can see difference uh, over time. Uh, sometimes you can actually see sunspots, dark regions on the sun. That's the only thing we can actually see from ground uh, changing. And these are basically strong uh, concentration of magnetic fields. Uh, if you look at the sun, either from ground or even from space, with the visible light or your eyes and visible light, you will still see the surface of the sun. And it also rotates. It takes about 27 days for the sun to rotate, and you can see the sunspot regions are developing. But if you go up in space, you can also see the sun's ultraviolet light. Uh, so even if you look at the window of the space station, you can only see this part with your eyes. But with instruments, we can have a filter in front of the telescope and block out all the visible light and only transmit ultraviolet or X-rays. And if you do that, the sun will look much more different. So this is the sun's atmosphere looking through an ultraviolet telescope. And now it looks much more exciting. You can see explosions and things thrown out, and the, the dark regions look now bright. And if you're changing the filter, we can move either far up in the atmosphere of the sun's hot corona. And now we can actually see even this magnetic field coming out of the sunspot region, where, of course, magnetic fields are invisible, but the ionized gas is then clinging to the magnetic fields. You can see them traced out. So this is what the sun do all the time, but we cannot see it from, from ground. And Sometimes we are living down here, uh, we are very small, we can put 1.3 million Earths inside the sun. Uh, and sometimes there's a huge explosion that sends out gas out in space and sometimes in our direction. And in this case, some of the gas actually falling down on the sun. These are actually real satellite pictures or images from satellites. And sometimes they will come in our direction. And this is an interesting camera. This is a wide angle camera looking at the sky from a satellite, uh, and we are covering the sun with a black disk inside the telescope, making an artificial eclipse. So we can see this very faint kind of outer part of the sun's atmosphere. These bright dots here are stars behind the sun, and we added the sun back in here with the computer bursts. When I start this, you can see the sun is throwing out explosions all directions, all time, and sometimes this direction. This is Venus passing by, there's a comet moving in here, and suddenly a solar storm hitting also the spacecraft and bombarding the detectors uh, and so on. So we're living very close to a very uh, dynamic and kind of angry star that's bombarding us all the time. So how is the, the northern lights created? Well, you have the solar wind and sometimes big explosion coming our way and this uh, cloud of gas will then spend one to three days before it reaching us. So we can actually forecast this a little bit. And when that gas or cloud of gas comes towards the Earth, it doesn't hit the Earth itself. We have, luckily, a protective magnetic field around us called the magnetosphere. So these particles usually go on each side. And in particular, with this, this uh, magnetic field coming from the Sun has opposite direction of the Earth's magnetic field. You get a very strong connection. And if it's the other way around, it's more like playing with wooden trains and you have the wrong uh, polarity on the magnet, you repel. But when there's the solar magnetic field and the solar storm comes here, connect here. Some particle then move down in, in a thunder line here and create what we call the daytime aurora. This is aurora that is created in the middle of the day. So normally you cannot see it because it's, it's, the sun is shining. But there's one place you can see it, and that's a Svalbard. So Svalbard is up here. Um, and in the, the, the wintertime, the shadow of the Earth will be down here. So you can actually see the northern lights there. But the nighttime aurora we are used to see, the green light, is caused by particles moving past the Earth, and the magnetic field reconnects, and they're pumping back the particles towards the Earth, and they will move along the magnetic field lines because they're charged particles. They don't like to go perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. 
and they are the one that causing the green light that we see in the nighttime. And then you have the same thing on the southern hemisphere and up there in the northern hemisphere in this ring-shaped oval, the northern light oval. So what's causing then the atmosphere to glow? So we tried to do, to do an animation in this my documentary. We made a new animation, tried to explain all the physics in a kind of easy way, and try to go through that now. So these particles are moving along the magnetic field lines because they are charged particles. At some point, they're moving down towards the polar region, and the density increasing, and they will start colliding with atoms and molecules in the atmosphere, typically oxygen and nitrogen. And when that happens, they will transfer some energy to these atoms. And then these atoms will then start to uh, emit lights on different colors. Typically, the green color you recognize, and on the top is typically red, and the lower part is typically purple when it's very strong on lights. And why do these particles send out light? Well, uh, all the atoms is built up like a, uh, it's a core and the electrons moving around like planets around uh, the sun. And they go in each different orbits uh, or shells. And when one particle hitting that atom and transfer energy, the outermost electron jumps up to different orbits, outermost orbit, and it doesn't like to be there. It has too much energy, it tries to get back, and to get back, you have to release that energy it received. And it sends out a light photon as a result of moving back down again. And that's what's happening. And then there's a billion of these happens every second, so you get this uh, ring-shaped area around the Earth or the magnetic pole. So you go to the North Pole or North Greenland, you don't see much northern lights. You have to be close to this uh, oval. And the mechanism is exactly the same you see in these lights on the ceiling over there. When we have a fluorescent light, you know, you, 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 it's a gas inside there. And you put on the electricity, and the electrons will then fly through the gas and excite the atoms you put in there. Typically, mercury uh, vapor is in there. So in a typically uh, fluorescent light, this, this thing happened two times. You're exciting the atom in here, it sends out ultraviolet radiation, or light, which, which you cannot see. But that ultraviolet uh, light hits the painting or coating on the glass, and the same thing happened one time more inside the glass and sends out visible light we can see. And we hold one of those out actually out there, and we can make it glow. So it's like a commercial sign, too. Again, the height of the northern lights, uh, typically from 100 kilometers up to several hundred kilometers, so it's a space phenomena, not the weather phenomena. Much higher than the airplanes and so on. The space station goes in about 400 kilometers, so they're flying through the top of the northern lights. This is how the view they have from the space station. Every night they're flying up there, they can see the northern lights. Not as strong as this, depending on, but you can also see that the, the northern lights really start in a very sharp uh, layer, and then it's stretching out in space quite far up. And then they, because the space station go close to the southern pole, poles, and then up north, so they see the, the, the aurora basically two times every orbit, 90 minutes orbit. A beautiful view they have up there. And all the planets that has an atmosphere and a magnetic field will also experience uh, uh, polar lights. Like the, you can see here Jupiter and Saturn have very distinctive uh, aurora ovals. Mars doesn't have a global magnetic field, so it doesn't have really a, an oval anymore, but you can see some patches uh, some places. So still Norway is kind of leading the way in aurora research, and, and the main reason is because we are far north, we are right under the oval, and that's why we built uh, the rocket range at Andrea uh, in 1962. Norway was actually the fifth country in the world that launched something into space. We were beaten by India with uh, two weeks, I think. So it was not many countries that did that. We also launching uh, rockets at the same time from Svalbard. Uh, and NASA, NASA is one of the biggest customers to launch uh, sounding rockets. They go up in space and they fall down again. And uh, there's lots of infrastructure up at Svalbard. This is the rocket range today. Uh, very modern place, very beautiful beaches too. Uh, water is quite cold, but uh, it's beautiful. And right now we're also building a launch facility for launching satellites. So this will be the first launch facility in Europe to launching small satellites. Hopefully it will be ready next year to launch the first rocket and the satellite there. I mentioned Svalbard, which is a very special place. It's really far north. This, this is Norway. There, here's Svalbard, closer to the North Pole you can never get. But it's actually a city there. It's a university there. Lots of scientific infrastructure up there. And like I mentioned, some of these particles come right down in this little uh, funnel here. And that's where you can see the, the daytime aurora. So that's why we have some big antennas looking up in the sky to look at the, the, how the aurora changed in the atmosphere. 
And we also have this Hendix Observatory, the world's biggest scientific observatory. And this long building with 32 rooms, and you can rent the room with a view. There's a dome, put your instrument, and go home to the United States or China or Japan and remotely control your instrument from uh, your home country through the fiber cable down to the mainland. So this is a very uh, active place. And this is actually the daytime aurora. This is an all-sky camera looking all around you in all directions. You can see the light from the city here and uh, the mountains around. And this is uh, about uh, 8.30 in the morning in this case. And then we're jumping to 1 o'clock at night, uh, daytime. Still aurora. These are a little bit different colors, a little bit more reddish, because the particles come straight from the sun down to the atmosphere. But it's a very nice place to, to measure the, the solar particles directly. And they're also supporting a sounding rocket experiment. This is a NASA rocket that uh, released 42 canisters of chemicals up in the atmosphere. And you can see how they're falling down, and then they can track how the dif different layers of the atmosphere moving in different directions. And compare that to the northern light, you can see some northern lights here too. So this is the active science, text, the science we do up there right now. Uh, also a little bit interesting with Svalbard, I'm going to mention this. This is Kongsberg Satellite Services uh, satellite station at Svalbard. Uh, the airport is just behind the rim here, out by the ocean. This is the world's largest satellite station in the world. They have 150 antennas up there now, taking data from all different countries and uh, down here, and uh, this is just an example. This is a very nice article in the New York Times recently. It shows also the size of these antennas. Inside there is a uh, parabolic dish, of course. The radon is there to protect it from snow and so on. Um, so NASA is actually, the NASA NOAA is the biggest customer. Uh, so when you see these hurricane pictures on CNN, they all come down at Svalbard and through the fiber, ca fiber cable and back to the United States. So all the weather data from in the United States come basically from these uh, satellite stations. Uh, the conference I'm going to now is talking about space weather, because the same process that creating the strong northern light is also creating space weather. And space weather is basically all the effect the sun has on our technology-based society. So it can be aircraft, satellite communication, GPS, navigation system, power grids, uh, drilling oil and gas, all these are affected by space weather. So we need to know more about it and we need to forecast it and we need to uh, uh, say, tell the power companies that uh, there might be a big solar storm uh, that can lead to power outages and so on. So this has been done today and lots of the customers uh, these forecasting centers has is actually the satellite owners and the power grid systems. Uh, today we have many satellites monitoring the sun 24 hours a day. So we can see when the storm coming in our direction, so we can uh, predict when it arrives. And then we can also predict basically how far south the northern light comes and where and when it happens. So by uh, tracking uh, the solar storm, if we do the same thing as satellite imagery to track a, a storm at the Earth. We can estimate from satellite imagery when the storm will hit the uh, coast of a country, for instance. In the same way we do with the solar storm. So we can get fairly good, accurate arrival times for these solar storms, plus minus uh, three, four hours, maybe. So by using the internet, there's lots of web pages out there you can s look at, and they will tell you when there's uh, going to be strong northern lights further south. And lots of apps, you can do the same thing. And lots of these apps actually also have push uh, messages, so you can, uh, it will it know where you are, so it will send you a push message if there's northern light visible where you are located. Very useful, too. And this, this forecasting system works that there's a satellite sitting just outside the Earth's magnetic field and measuring the solar wind speed. And uh, when the wind speed goes up or the density in the, in the solar wind goes up, when the solar storm passing that satellite, it's like having a buoy out in the ocean. This forecasting system then will change and tell you when the Northern Light will move. So this is typically where the Northern Light is located every single day. And if you're north of this thin line, you can still typically see the northern lights on the horizon north of you. As soon as the satellite measures the increased wind speed or density, this map will then change. And say one hour later, it will look like this. Maybe one hour later, it will be like this, depending on the speed and uh, what the satellite measuring. If it looks like this, you can see the northern lights all down to north Germany in this case. This is how they're working. 
So there's a, there's a scale they're using. It's like an earthquake scale. Uh, earthquake scale. It's a KP index scale. It goes from 0 to 9. So 0 is the weakest, and 9 is the strongest. And if it's 9, you can see the northern light all the way down to uh, this country or even Italy. That's what happened when Galileo gave it a name to the northern lights. That doesn't happen that often. Maybe a few times every solar cycle, three, four times every 10 years. So then you have to be on alert, of course, and follow this if you want to not missing it. Um, so, again, like I said, why is Norway the best country to go to to see the Northern Lights? Let's see if I can try to convince you here. Um, this is from a, a, a talk I gave in New York uh, recently. Uh, if you're in New York, actually, you are same latitude as south of Italy or south of Spain. If you are in Oslo, you are in the same latitude as south of Alaska. If you are in Tromsø, North Norway, you are the same latitude as north Alaska. And if you go to Svalbard, you are north of everything else, basically. And typically, the northern light is located in this band here. This is where you can see the northern light most days uh, if it's clear. Of course, you can go to northern Canada, Greenland, north Alaska, or Siberia. But these places are really hard to get to. It's typically very few places you can go without having a charter flight. Uh, it's very cold. We have a Gulf Stream, so it's much milder in Norway than compared to north of Canada, and so on. Um, so that's why Scandinavia is, is a very good place to go to. If you look at Norway and compare to Sweden and Finland also, I mean, Norway has airports at every single little city. They're easy to access. They have lots of hotels, lots of tourist uh, things to do. Uh, compared to Finland and Sweden, there's a few airports up there too. Um, but again, this is the region where you can see the northern lights most frequently. So you can see part of the northern part of northern Finland is there, Sweden and Finland, but Norway up here is more frequently. So I will say it's even better to go uh, to Norway. But it's also very nice to go to North Sweden and Finland, of course. Uh, also, there's a very nice way of seeing the North Lights, is to take the coastal steamer. It's a, it goes from Bergen here, and moving up to all little small places, and go up to Kirkenes and back again. There's uh, 10 ships going up and down. And they have a special theme on the North Lights. They turn off all the lights on the ship. Uh, even if you go to bed, you can, you can sign up for a wake-up call. The captain will call you and get you out of the room if there's no light outside again. And now there's a new uh, also provider called Havila, just started uh, one and a half year ago, which also do the same thing. So it's a very popular way of doing and see the northern lights from a ship. First of all, it goes away far away from city, li city lights, so it's very dark where you're going. Uh, so it's really it's a scenic way of, of doing this. Uh, like I said, the northern light will move further south depending on the strength of the solar storm. So sometimes the northern light will actually move down to Europe, like here too, not that frequent. I tried to find a picture from uh, here. Uh, this is the only one I found that was taken in this country, I think. Um, I found uh, quite a few more from Italy uh, in principle. But this is what you typically will see if you see the northern light that far south, more like Galileo saw, mostly red, maybe some green in the low horizon. This is just an example of uh, some solar storms in the, f in the spring, which I showed in when I talked in the US. This is a satellite picture showing the northern light from the satellite going into the northern states of the United States. And these are some of the pictures from the same storm. Uh, typically, then you see the northern light only in the horizon, low horizon. So. This is Washington State, North Dakota, and so on. So this is the sun today. This is what we're talking about this conference and how we can predict and improve the prediction of solar storms. Right now, it's a very quiet sun. There's a little sunspot up there. Uh, but the sun has actually an 11-year cycle, so we have, have seen now that the sun is more active than the prediction was a few years back. So it looks like this will be also a very good aurora season. So there have been very much aurora the last uh, year and two years, actually. Um, this is a <coughs> excuse me. This is the sun uh, or the sun's corona, and it's not only solar storms that are making uh, northern lights. These black features here are called coronal holes. And from these holes, the solar wind speeds out with a twice as fast speed as the rest of the sun. So it's like a hair dryer. You go around and blowing around in the space. So right now, this is the last 48 hours of the sun. So these, this black hole here is getting closer to the center of the sun, and it's actually growing. So in a few days, one, one or two days, the wind speed from this corn hole will hit us, and we will have strong and northern lights again. So this is actually, I think I've, um, yeah, I should also mention, maybe some of you saw the eclipse yesterday. 
Yeah. Well, it was it was cloudy until um, twelve something or to close to one o'clock. Then it cleared up. So we we saw it from the the conference center down here uh, later. It looks like this almost, but this is also set from a satellite. It was a satellite that also saw the moon passing in front of the, the sun. But this is the, the long-term prediction they, they make based on these coronal holes. So this is uh, um, today. So tomorrow night, it might also be fairly strong corona. Uh, no, strong northern lights. Uh, this is the Cape index again. It goes up to five. Thank you. Uh, that means we will see the northern lights in south part of Norway, maybe down to Denmark. Uh, Cape index 6, you will see it in the northern part of, of Germany. But you need probably an index up to 7, 8 to see it here in this country. And that doesn't happen that often. So you have to come to Norway again. That's uh, the clue. One way of seeing the Nordlight, which is quite uh, amazing, is if you fly into the United States or flying home from the United States, especially in particularly from California or LA or Seattle, because you're flying the shortest way if, if the big circle, and that's over Greenland. And then you need a window seat on the left side of the plane. That's very important. Then you can see the north lights. But because of the, the light in the cabin, they don't turn it all the way down. You need to put your jacket over your head to kind of shield so you can see outside the window. But it's possible to see it. And you see it basically every night you fly, you will see the north light because you fly over the clouds and so on. Uh, and I took a, so a, a short video also when I flew from from uh, North Norway to South Norway. It was a very strong geomagnetic storm, uh, but it gives you an idea how it looks like from the airplane when you look at the window. And this is taken with a, with a camera that can actually film the Northern Lights in real time. It's a very light sensitive camera. So this is actually a, a video recording. And I had my jacket over my head, of course. I looked like an idiot probably, but I got to see this. And this is actually, uh, the captain borrowed the camera too, so he took it up in the cockpit. This is the view they have, because they have it quite dark in the cockpit. So it's, it's really amazing to see it from the aircraft. Uh, another thing that's important if you go to see the Northern Light is to be patient. This is a, a picture I took from Hurtruten, close to Trollfjorden. Uh, in Lofoten Island, and just five minutes before this picture was taken, there was no Northern Light, I couldn't see anything. And then suddenly this showed up. And two, three minutes later, it looked like this. The whole sky was green, it, it, moving all over the place. And uh, that's very typical for the Northern Light, uh, if you want to see the Northern Light. It doesn't last the whole night, even if the forecast is really good. Um, I'm going to show a curve here. This blue curve basically shows when the curve drips down, that means that there are very strong variations in the compass needle, basically. And you see there was a little bit of activity here at around 8 o'clock at night. But suddenly this, this outbreak, this was the same you saw a picture of. It lasted for half an hour, an hour. That's very typical. And we never know if that's going to happen at the 9 o'clock in the evening, 12 o'clock, or 2 o'clock at night. So you never shouldn't give up even if it's no northern light before 12 o'clock. It could happen later. And for those who take pictures, it's uh, some short basic rules. I mean, the most important thing is actually having a tripod because you typically need long exposure times. Uh, and also, basically, a camera that you can put in man and mold. That means a DSLR camera. And some cell phones can take some semi-good pictures, but it's, it's better to have a good camera. And then, of course, you can discuss you know, or having an expensive lens with a low F number, letting lots of lights in. You can turn up the ISO with new cameras now, quite high. <clears throat> and uh, but you need long exposure time in principle. So then uh, the tripod is the most important thing you, you bring with you. I'm going to show an example here. This is a typical picture <coughs> taken with a 15 exposure, 15 second long exposure. But of course, in that time, 15 seconds, the, the northern light has moved. That's why it looked blurred. But you get more intensity, of course. And this is a picture of a two-second exposure. Now you can see the fine structure in the northern lights. A little bit more what you will see with your eyes in principle if you see it. And <clears throat> this is the typical selfie mode. You put your friends up in a row and you put a long exposure time, 10 seconds or 15 seconds. And during those 15 seconds, they will be totally dark. You, you don't see them. You sort of shadow of them. But you use your iPhone or something in your, your flashlight and you put it up for one second, or half a second up and down, that's enough, they will be illuminated. 
And it doesn't really happen. I mean, if they're moving around, that doesn't really matter because it's only that half seconds you are putting light in the face, they will be in focus. So quite easy to do. And I also mentioned earlier that lots of people were afraid of northern lights before, and they are also connected to dead spirits. And this little sequence I filmed, um, uh, this is in Svolvar, North Norway, and we had dinner with a group of uh, foreign visitors, and suddenly somebody came in to the restaurant and said, there's a beautiful northern lights outside. So we all went out, and this is a short sequence from that film I filmed with us, my, my Sony camera. And I'm going to stop it, and I think you're going to see what I mean, that people thought they saw something in the Northern Lights. <laughs> oh my goodness. Can you see the face? Eyes, nose, mouth. It's like an avatar or like a Simba Lion King or something. So again, this, the shape of Northern Lights can sometimes take shape of something people thought was uh, spirits or something. Uh, another important thing if you see the northern lights is that uh, your eyes is not as a camera. Very often people get a little bit disappointed when they come up and see the northern lights, especially with the, they only see the, the weak northern lights in the, in the horizon. It doesn't look green, it looks grayish, yellowish. And that's because our eyes is very different from a camera. And also the camera can expose for many seconds, we cannot do that. So in principle, uh, the difference is that the camera here has equal number of RGB sensors. Our eyes is basically consist of thousands of black and white sensors, which is our night vision. And we have a very few color sensors that gives us the daytime colors and also sharpness. So it, you see the same effect if you look at your uh, park, uh, green grass at the daytime when the sun shines. When the night comes, you don't see the green anymore. You see just a grayish, grayish kind of color on the grass. Exactly the same thing that we are our night vision is not very good. Uh, so this is typically maybe what you will see with your eyes, and then they turn the video into what the camera will see, much brighter colors and much more intensity. So it's also nice to know that so you don't get too disappointed because where postcards are, you know, they have been photoshopped and everything like this. Uh, <coughs> but it's also individual. Some people see more colors at night than others, and also if it's really active northern lights like this, then you actually see the purple and the red and the bluish tints uh, like this. So again, this is a guy from uh, Mike Taylor. He made this uh, kind of slide here. This is what your eyes see, this is what the camera see, and so on. So it's a little bit different. Uh, this sequence here, I filmed, we were up uh, with a group of people again outside Tromsø. Tromsø is over here. And we were up in the mountain for almost two hours. Uh, we rented a moxie taxi, so it was quite expensive to have it sitting there waiting. And we gave up because there was no northern lights, so just some week in the horizon. And we went down to the city again, and halfway to the city, suddenly I watched one of my apps, and it said, now it's starting to move, this is a magnetic field. So we went outside, and this is what I then filmed. You can enjoy this a little bit. And this is real-time video, too, with the camera. This is exactly how it moves in the sky. Also notice quite the rapid movement and like almost like shockwaves going through the northern lights. It's quite amazing. And all the movements are basically the Earth's magnetic field that also shifting due to the solar storm that hitting the magnetic field. I can stop this. So the last thing I want to just mention to you is that we, we made a, a Northern Light experience, a kind of a museum uh, exhibit in Oslo. It was part of a store in, in Oslo. It was a four-dimensional kind of experience where it was uh, lead tiles on the floor and the projection on the, on the wall and also the ceiling. 
And we had heat and cold air coming, so you can feel the closeness of the sun. And so it, it, they basically explain how the Northern Light is formed, uh, created, and then we, you, you will take it on the travel from Oslo through Norway up to North Norway, and then the Northern Light comes on the screen. So I'm going to show a little trailer that's summarizing a little bit, but this is a 15-minute kind of presentation that we had for tourists in Oslo. And this is also possible to, to install other places here in, in the city, of course. If somebody's interested, we can try to install this here also. So I'm going to, again, end with this uh, uh, book and documentary. Um, web page, you can find that book and everything. <coughs> so I'm going to stop there, and then thank you for the attention, and I will be happy to try to answer some questions, if you have any. Thank you so much. Thank you. secret one. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really fascinating. And uh, if there are questions, you are welcome. I have one question. Um, <laughs> animals are not very good in, in science, as far as I know. Do you know if animals react to the northern light? Uh, I'm not sure if they react so much of the light, but we know that there are lots of animals, uh, migrating animals, like pigeons and whales and uh, they are affected by the variation in the Earth's magnetic field. So it's a very famous or well-known effect when people doing pigeon races, that when you have a strong geomagnetic storm, the pigeons have a hard time finding their way home. Because they're using the Earth's magnetic field as one of their navigation systems. They have some kind of iron files in their brain. And there's also, uh, we think also some of the whale, when whales are stranding on the, on the beach sometimes, they are confused in their internal compasses and so on. So this is... Uh, and there's actually also published on papers, uh, in particularly Russia, that uh, there's some uh, frequencies of uh, cardiac arrest due to geomagnetic storms and so on. So there might be some medical or animal effects on that way. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, now, everybody will be invited for a uh, reception uh, just outside. Uh, we uh, will link up his uh, photos uh, here so we can enjoy his photos uh, during uh, the reception. We keep the door open. So again, thank you to Paul Becker for taking Welcome. time uh, for to uh, give this lecture. Thank you. And um, should we say something more about uh, you, Arvoya? You are okay. <laughs> you see, yeah, it's good. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you.